Hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started here. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Zwicker. I'm, I'm going to be hosting today's webinar. I am the program director of health policy at the School of Public Policy and an assistant professor in kinesiology at, at University of Calgary. The School of Public Policy is Canada's leading policy school known for our practical research and for bringing people together to discuss important issues with experts, which is really what we're here to do today. So thank you so much for joining us uh, today for this School of Public Policy webinar series. If you have to leave early, we're going to post our recordings to all of our webinars on our website and on, you on a YouTube channel. So you'll receive a link in the follow up email um, that you'll get because you registered. So today's topic, um, today's webinar is going to focus on uh, somewhat around coronavirus and also around the topic of uh, Canada's effort to, or sorry, Alberta's effort to restructure uh, physician compensation. Um, particularly focusing around primary care physicians. So our speaker for today is Thomas Lang. Uh, Thomas is a recent graduate of the School of Public Policy's Masters in Public Policy program. He's a, currently a research coordinator with the University of Calgary Faculty of Social Work and the Matheson Center for Mental Health Research and Education. He is a 2018-2019 recipient of the Dr. Robert Mansell Capstone of the Year Award, and his most recent publication explores how to align Alberta physician pay reform with patient, provider, and cost aims. His research with the School of Public Policy has been supported through Master's in Public Policy Graduate Scholarship Program and the Health Policy Studentship Award. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Tom on this project, and we're really, really pleased to be able to share some of the findings from our work here today. So for the format today, if you're not familiar with our webinars, uh, Thomas is going to take about 10 minutes to give a briefing on the issue, and then we'll open it up to you, the audience, for Q&A. So please type your questions in the Q&A box below, and I will pose them to uh, Tom, and we'll have a discussion about it. Um, so without further ado, I would like to turn the presentation over to Tom. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I'm seeing the numbers and uh, I'm really excited uh, to be sharing this with everyone. Uh, this is a very timely policy area and a, a courting a lot of controversy right now. So I just want to um, first start by giving an overview of uh, sort of what's been going on right now with um, the Alberta government and their relations with doctors around uh, payment reform. So just give me a quick sec here. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. All right. So uh, I'm going to just start back a, a couple of years. So Alberta has been uh, trying out different alternatives to the standard fee for service and Fee for service is, for those who don't know, is when you're remunerated based on um, the individual medical service you perform. You know, you're not given a, a, a weekly salary based on your hours or kind of thing like that. It's it's based on a per service basis, and uh, it's been it's 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 widely seen as the default option across Canada, um, and it's it's courted co uh, controversy and uh, questions about how efficient it is. So. Alberta has been trying to uh, experiment with other options. Capitation is one, and this is what uh, we're going to start talking about, the blended capitation, which is where you blend fee-for-service with payments per um, individual patient that you have in your, in your care. So rather than a per-service, it's a per-patient. Um, so they, they launched that pilot in uh, 2017. Um, since then, there we go. Since then, it's been criticized that it, it didn't get a lot of buy-in from doctors, um, and that kind of painted a target on a lot of doctors' backs that maybe they're not willing to explore new options and, and yada, yada, yada. And so there's been some uh, debate around this and how do we get more doctors onto maybe more efficient alternatives? Um, now, we had an election uh, last year and the pl party platform was more on uh, balancing the budget uh, fiscal sustainability, other areas like that. And so the first uh, action that this government took was to impanel the McKinnon 
or report. And that looked at a wide range of areas that uh, we could uh, cut costs and save and, and change how we spend. One of the things they circled on though was physicians. And that was interesting um, because its calls were, uh, you know, Alberta is spending more per capita than other provinces on physicians and we need more spending restraint. And the way to do it is to get more what's called ARP, which is alternative relationship plans with these uh, fee-for-service alternative models. We need more of that to, to, to save money. And it said, you know, try and develop this, you know, with negotiation, but also consider, you know, you're the government, you have legislative options. And so the government tabled Bill 21, which gave them a uh, power to basically, among other things, uh, cancel existing agreements and impose other ones. Um, so that when that when that bill received dissent, that was quite um, that was quite a concern, I think, in the medical community. Um, around this time, coincidentally, um, the Health Quality Council of Alberta uh, evaluated two uh, capitation-based models that had been operating in Alberta for quite some time. Uh, so there are two clinics and, and the report essentially came back saying like these models are doing really good for primary care and for um, achieving a good value for dollar um, downstream it's actually saving the healthcare system money upstream the cost is a bit is, is a little bit higher maybe compared to other fee-for-service practices but overall it's saving money and I'm fast forwarding a little bit um, in February, the master agreement uh, that the AMA has with Alberta government was canceled through Bill 21, and this new funding framework was brought in, it, um, which, is, which again is quite controversial because it uh, it wasn't a replacement of fee for service. Really, it, it's not replacing it with ARP. It's just taking fee for service and adding in restrictions and uh, you know so certain billing restrictions and, and 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 stuff like that that were aimed to cut costs. Um, then we have coronavirus. The coronavirus hits, it hit Alberta, um, it's, it's hit Alberta pretty hard. Um, we're, you know, all our frontline workers are doing their best to contain the virus and we're doing our best as a society to contain the spread. Um, but in the process of this, governments had to sort of walk back a bit of the physician framework elements because it's too much of a shock to deal with something like this while also dealing with probably one of the worst pandemics we've ever had. Um, so you'll note the date says March 2020 to the present. It, this is ongoing. We just had a walk back of rural um, caps this last, last week and the debate keeps going. In the, between there though, the AMA has filed a lawsuit against Alberta Health to try and restore that collective bargaining um, process that they were frozen out of because of Bill 21. So this is the, this is the environment we're in right now. It's very politically charged. It's hard to get some like, you know, just grounded policy discourse when everyone's angry at each other. So for the rest of this webinar, we're gonna talk about a paper that uh, myself, Dr. Swicker, and Dr. Travis Carpenter of uh, University of Toronto um, that we co-authored on this subject of how do we implement more ARP? Because um, implementation, you know, we've talked a lot about models and the different types of models that are out there. We haven't talked a lot about um, the policy around implementation. So first, just as a background, we focused on general practitioners, um, which is also what the McKinnon Report tended to focus on when it talked about more ARP, it said that to, uh, family medicine needs more of it, more than maybe than specialists. Um, and just as a snapshot, the data is a bit dated, but uh, fee-for-service doctors make up an overwhelming majority of general practice in Alberta, and only only 4.3% of them are remunerated purely on ARP. And even 8% around are only remunerated on a blend of the two. So this, this raises the question, like how do, we get, how do we get more clinical ARP if we assume that it's the answer to all our, our problems? And addressing of whether or not it is the answer to all our problems is another question unto itself. Um, so to evaluate that, we look, we use this model, it's called the quadruple uh, aim model for healthcare improvement. And, um, sorry, I'm just, that, there we go. Um, the quadruple aim 
model of healthcare improvement. And it focuses on three, or sorry, four aims. Uh, costs, reducing cost is one, and what we want to implement, we want to see that it's saving the health system money, whether that's downstream or upstream. We want to see good quality interactions with patients, so patient experience. Is that improving? Uh, population health, is that improving? Like uh, reduced disease burden, things like that. But then there's this other aim that needs to be um, looked at too, which is care team well-being. You know, how are the providers experiencing this new ARP or these other physician payment models? Um, you know, fee-for-service incentivizes doctors to work really hard and um, you know, burnout's a factor. So there's that we need to consider. So that's the, the framework. Here's what we looked at. We looked at what other provinces have done and noteworthy cases. Nova Scotia is the first one. Um, and by the way, this, this paper is uh, available for download at the School of Public Policy's website. It goes into a lot of detail on these three provinces we looked at, but Nova Scotia has the highest percentage of total payment coming out of alternatives um, from doctors. And their approach to it until recently has been to offer alongside fee for service this salary model. This uh, it was it was tested with with um, specialists, and then was rolled out to GPs. So it's kind of a one size fits all approach. Um, what has been noticed in recent years is that Nova Scotian doctors, some of them have actually left the province to pursue other alternative models uh, in neighboring provinces. So that's an interesting. Point to bring up it challenges this this assumption some people make that doctors don't like alternative payment models and they only like people service some are willing to move for them so we then looked at ontario and ontario experimented very early on in canada's history on um, alternative payments and with ontario they crafted over time they crafted sort of a menu of different um, and very well studied and, and, and looked at um, alternative models and so and specifically tailored to the context of primary care so physicians could look at them and figure out based on their um, dynamic of, of their practice you know what best works for me and then voluntarily opt into that costs again overall um, some higher upstream costs they needed to up the payment initially at least to incent doctors onto it um, but the downstream cost savings were there too um, Patients were noted to have lower hospitalization rates and emergency department utilization. So it was very well received. Now we then looked at British Columbia and British Columbia is an example of a province that doesn't have very high ARP uptick, um, similar to Alberta. We were curious if they had done anything. And one thing we noted is that they really didn't have a lot of options. Their, their approach was to just augment traditional fee for service. They've added some incentive programs. They've added some restrictions, like the billing daily billing cap, which is something that the Alberta government has instituted or was instituting with their new framework. But these, you know, evaluations of this have found that uh, arguably these augmentations haven't actually achieved any um, improvement in terms of system performance goals. Um, so it challenges this question of can you just augment fee for service, try and pick up the, the bad parts from the good. Um, the evidence doesn't seem to be supportive of that. So I'm going to just be cognizant of time and stop here. This can again all be read uh, in greater detail in our report, but you know, what is Alberta's approach um, currently and what it could be? We, we recommended initially, even before the coronavirus, that um, you know, voluntary and negotiated agreements are, are best. Um, there's no evidence from other jurisdictions that a forced legislation is necessarily the best, you know, improvement on the quadruple aim framework for, for pay. So um, we recommend that we need to come to a point where um, Alberta can rebuild its trust with its doctors, um, which, as we've seen, has, has been quite frayed and strong. So and now what we're looking at here is let's let's get to a point of crafting out ARPs that are very well tailored to primary care. Because currently we don't have specifically tailored ones that are freely available for doctors to opt into. They're similar to Nova Scotia's approach of sort of one size fits all salary or 
sessional um, hourly things for part time. Um, so we need to do more study on this and we need to not be necessarily alienating our workforce as we go through this type of study. So I'm going to leave it there and I think I'm going to turn it back for some Q&A time. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Turn it back over to Jen. All right, thanks Tom. Um, and that was just a, a very quick overview of the content you can find in the, the paper. So like you said, um, so we are going to move into Q&A and I encourage you to submit your questions uh, in the, the box that you have below. We have a number of questions coming in and I'll do my best to kind of synthesize them and, and pose them back. Um, so the first question is, is really around um, this, this concept of um, balancing uh, efficiency and effectiveness of, of funding models. Obviously, there's a lot of cost considerations. You talked about the quadruple aim model as a, as a framework. Um, at what point are we assessing kind of the value of investing and, and funding um, uh, physicians and, and how we're compensating them? And, and can you provide some comment on, on how that framework was applied to um, in some of the different models you were you were looking at there, Tom? Yeah, efficient, effective. Um, and, you know, first of all, I just want to say, like, the physician funding element is only one part of the equation we do have to remember. There's a lot of um, high level goals that we want to achieve in our primary care system. and uh, maybe a limited understanding of how much physician, like the way we pay physicians addresses it. So the, I guess trying to find that, that efficiency and effective balance um, while also trying to make sure we have value for investment. Um, one thing that I would point out is that uh, in, in the evaluations that have been done on a lot of these models, both the Health Quality Council's report and uh, the ones that have been done in peer-reviewed articles from Ontario. Ontario has a lot of literature on this, by the way. Um, the, the big uh, benefit they saw was sort of downstream that patients had lower hospital, hospitalization rates, emergency department utilization. Um, and we had a hard time necessarily finding, you know, is there a direct causality link between the two? It's a lot of comparing and observing. And at least from uh, the consensus in the literature, they aren't mutually exclusive. Um, we can get good value for dollar and we can make our health, we can make our primary care system by the way we remunerate more efficient um, in terms of things like uh, avoidable costs, like higher, um, hospitalization rates and emergency department rates. So yeah, I think there's a lot of, I think these arguments don't exist in silos. Um, I, I think that's my, my critique, I think of the McKinnon report that it seemed to, it seemed to only preface and what we've talked about ARP is it's only about cost saving and get and value for dollar, but you know, we can achieve that balance in the quadruple aim. Yeah, thanks. And there's been some questions and comments about the trade-offs that you're talking about and how to kind of balance those trade-offs. And I think, you know, a key point you're you're making is around, you know, the need to consider kind of all four factors of, of that quadruple aim model. Um, we have uh, several questions pertaining to that um, um, model that had the pilots that have come out of um, the Crowfoot clinic and the Tabor clinic with the Health Quality Council report you referred to um, and questions about what the role of those pilots, pilots that have been going on for quite a while might be as a kind of made in Alberta approach and um, how you see those fitting into some of the comparisons to alternatives you've looked at in other provinces. Yeah, the Health Quality Council of Alberta report, I highly recommend as, as, a, as a read um, if you haven't already, um, it's long, but it's, it's, it's very well uh, conducted and it's on um, two clinics that are on very capitation based um, payment models. And they've been on them for many years now, as I understand, I think some up to 20 now. Um, and the, you know, the, there's been some debate about, you know, how those uh, contracts were 
were arrived at and you know that that process was was tough but um the models themselves um we're seeing you know a lot of evidence that uh you know that they that they work in um aligning like our the way we pay our physicians to the the broader healthcare goals that we've established for primary care um one thing that the health quality council of alberta report notes is that in pursuing these agreements it's not a one size fits all you can't just um, put out one sort of broad type of model and assume that with every type of primary care clinic in every type of setting, that it's going to achieve that optimal outcome. The optimal outcome being, you know, maybe doctors or maybe the cost of physician services is a bit high um, on these models, but the downstream savings are more. So the net is a savings, which is um, in, in summation a, a part of what Health Quality Council found. Um, but I look at our current models right now that we have um, and some of the pilots that like, again, the blended capitation pilot that I mentioned at the beginning is not the same thing that the Health Quality Council was looking at. That would, Those are the pre-existing ones before 2017. They're in phase two, I believe, right now, and they're recruiting right now on that. And I'm not, I don't think details have been released to the public yet on both what has happened with those clinics. Um, but again, from other provinces, what we've seen, um, you know, capitation seems like a, a very promising model. We don't make recommendations on specific models, but the common theme we found is when it, it does work, it's been done because like we've taken the time to look at those nuances. This is a very technocratic area of public policy. So yeah, thanks. And, and you know, getting at those incentives and, and like you were saying in Ontario, the learnings were around that kind of menu of options and the buy-in um, kind of that was gained from physicians. So I think that's that's an important comment. Um, moving to kind of another aspect of that quadruple, and there's been a number of comments or questions around um, looking at outcomes. So the role of, of different compensation models on patient outcomes. Um, I yeah, know as a part of the quadruple aim framework, that was a piece that you looked at. Um, can you comment on <clears throat> how easy it was to assess that and um, what type of metrics tended to be used if they were used at all? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's very hard to assess um, outcomes relating to the payment models because payment model, again, like we said, payment models are, are part of the equation, but not the be all, like they're not the only factor that matters in, in attaining value for dollar. Um, and for more reading on that, I'd refer to the um, Auditor General's report from 2017. I can't remember the name of it now, but it, it talks like, it, it, it does talk a little bit about, you know, we want more patient-centered care. That's an outcome that we want to see better quality, um, better ranking of the health, like system satisfaction. And there were a couple papers that looked at uh, some, sat some satisfaction uh, metrics and things like that. Um, and, and again, it's, it's more of an association, but they tended, you know, they tended to, to find higher patient satisfaction in some of these models, especially and this is more coming out of Ontario's research. But the other thing too is uh, there were some risks that were found in the Ontario models I want to point out. Um, because again, not every model is perfect. Not you know, fee-for-service has its limitations, but capitation also has limitations as well. Um, what was noted in Ontario is physicians maybe were selecting patients that were already of lower risk. So when you do those studies on outcomes, like, yeah, the patients have higher outcomes because they're, they're not really a high medical risk. So that makes it very difficult to evaluate. Um, and a lot of blended capitation models since then that are being developed, and by the way, Nova Scotia is developing one right now, so to say that their one size fits all approach is current isn't necessarily the case. But what they are looking at, what Alberta has been looking at, its blended capitation is making sure that we control for that kind of um, adverse incentive potentially. So yeah, it, it's, it's a tough question to answer. Um, what, what are the best metrics to measure? Um, I think that we're gonna need a lot more both quantitative and qualitative analysis on some of these models about how patients perceived it. It was tough to align patient experience, particularly um, 
to the, what we found in the literature and what other provinces did. It was easier to find things that were more downstream, like these patients had less hospitalization rates, these patients uh, that were on these alternatives. Yeah, I didn't go to the emergency department as often for uh, things that would otherwise be avoidable in primary care and, and such. So just kind of identifying, maybe you need to consider impacts on quality of life and yeah. kind of more acute health outcomes instead of uh, service utilization outcomes, because I think that's what you were finding a lot was like use, use of administrative data and service use outcomes was often kind of the best we could do in, in terms of what could find. Yeah, really quickly on that, like the main metric that I think has been used in, in assessing, you know, good improvement of the health system seems to be life expectancy at birth or life expectancy at 65. That is uh, certainly a nice comparable metric, maybe province to province, but the issue is there is it escapes maybe quality because you can live a long life and have a, a very poor quality, health related quality of life too. So we want to yeah, not limit ourselves to just those one sort of comparative metrics we have. And uh, I think that's been a real challenge in um, setting our policy agenda in healthcare. We, um, we aren't totally sure what we want we aren't totally sure what we want to achieve sometimes and the best metrics we have um, don't necessarily capture everything yeah thanks and, I, and we've had a comment about just to note that um, primary care networks are often measuring outcomes in in family physicians practices in conjunction with the health quality council of alberta so um, you know, that's sometimes already a part of kind of usual care practices and that perhaps there's a, a way to integrate that into thinking about how we're thinking about compensation strategies and, and things like that. So um, a great point. Um, we just wanted to <clears throat> also think about some of those downstream um, effects you were you were talking about. So often when we're looking at the cost of compensation models, um, I think this really came out in your comment around Ontario. The challenge was often that cost savings were found um, in reducing hospital visits and, and more acute care service use in favor of people visiting um, community care, primary care. Um, so, you know, is there, <clears throat> do you have comments on that around um, how that gets factored in when sometimes there's kind of a really focused, sometimes political kind of view on, on specific physician compensation? Does, does this need to be, um, from kind of you're looking at other provinces, does this need to be um, considered as, as a kind of a bigger picture component? Yeah, certainly. I think, uh, like, like I said, we, we, our discussion around um, physician pay reform, I feel, to be honest, has been very, very narrow. It hasn't, um, praised a lot of the downstream efforts that have happened as a result of changes. And I'm, I'm talking about that um, Canada-wide. Um, we just sort of look at that physician cost curve year over year and see that it's rising and are wondering, well, can we just ramp it down as fast as we can? And I, I think that that kind of thinking doesn't take into account those down, like um, the costs downstream. And when we think about implementation, which again is the the meat and bones of this paper that we wrote, um, we don't, you know, they're all related. So cost reductions, um, care team well-being, and then the, the outcome side of everything. You know, if you're just going to pursue a policy to uh, aggressively cut the the pay level uh, across the board, and you know, uh, freeze out doctors from compensation discussion, um, that's going to be a negative morale booster and probably have downstream negative effects on the other areas of healthcare. So we have to think of this as a more holistic approach. We have to think, you know, so let's take the um, Crowfoot Tabor clinics, for example, if they're up again,
that uh, you know forced everyone onto some kind of blended capitation um, that's similar to maybe these these contracts or something like that. Um, what if then physician payment actually then has to then increases on that curve we see every year? Then if we're only looking at the cost reduction side and we're only looking at it from the uh, perspective of the budget where we just look at the physician cost, then we would view that as a policy failure under that thinking, but it might not be. So we do need a more balanced, uh, I think, approach to how we view this discussion, or how, we, how we take on this discussion. I think, yeah, I think if anything, that's become very clear over the last months and, and weeks. So. Um, that's all our time for today. Um, I just really wanted to thank everybody for all their questions. Um, hopefully I did some justice to try and summarize them. We're happy to connect with, with each of you um, if you have further questions and um, follow up. We encourage you to, to read the paper as well and we had an op-ed in the Edmonton Journal and, and are keen to connect further on this topic. Um, so in closing, I just want to uh, really thank Thomas for providing your insight today and, and to our audience for, for all joining you and for your really excellent, insightful questions. Uh, the School of Public Policy will be hosting regular webinars on a variety of topics, so please keep an eye out on our website under events and sign up as they get confirmed. The next webinar is going to be Tuesday, May 5th at 12 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time. The topic is on is called uh, Better in Theory, Why a Basic Income is Not the Right Policy Tool for This Moment. moment. And it's going to be presented by our, our wonderful um, researchers, Anna Cameron and Jillian uh, Petit, from the School of Public Policy's Fiscal and Economic Policy Research Area. Stay well and stay safe, everyone, and take care. And we look forward to connecting with you soon.